So my name is Richard Coombs and I work for uh, Symantec. I've worked for Symantec for around the last 10 years. Um, and Symantec uh, is a cybersecurity company. So very happy to, to be here. Um, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me to talk as well. When, when we spoke before, uh, we thought it'd be great if we can start this talk off um, with, with myself because what we're going to go through for the next 30 minutes is the threats we have out there and the techniques that attackers are using in cyberspace today. So, why Symantec and who is Symantec? Um, so as I mentioned before, Symantec, um, cybersecurity company, it is the world's largest cybersecurity company today. And the breadth and depth of the portfolio allows us to have a good view on what's happening out there in the world. So essentially we are your CCTV cameras out there. So what does this give us? So this gives us um, our secret source, which is we call the GIN. Okay, we're not, we're not drinking it. It stands for our Global Intelligence Network. So if we look at the, the 175 million um, endpoints, laptops, desktops and servers we have out there, both in our enterprises and in the consumer products we have, the Norton products, um, we actually scan 30% of the world's business emails, around 2 billion emails a day. And our blue coat um, proxy technology scans and um, makes around 8 billion web requests every single day, including 1 billion previously unseen web requests. And what does this intelligence give us? Well, it gives us the ability um, to produce reports. It also feeds back in to our product. So what I'm going to run through today is called the, we call it the ISCR, the Internet Security Threat Report. It's available free on Symantec's website for, to download. Um, and I'm only going to touch on the main themes of it today, but do please um, download it from the website. It's about 90 pages long. It's a great read. I know a lot of other vendors produce a threat report each year. I would recommend you read ours. Um, the other good one to read is the Verizon Data Breach Report as well. So, some of the things we're going to come through and cover today. The top messages, so we've seen attackers weaponizing um, things that are already on your machines today. We'll talk about targeted attacks and how that landscape has shifted um, from espionage to, to sabotage. We'll talk about a very big bank heist we saw, um, founded by North Korea. Email being the weapon of choice in 2016 as well, we'll go into that. Um, we'll talk about ransomware, so I guess that's pretty important to everyone, um, and who's actually paying the ransoms. Um, and then the new frontier stuff, so the cloud, um, IoT, what's happening in security over there. Okay, so the first topic is living off the land. So um, I don't mean that um, bad actors are, are growing their own potatoes. What I mean is they're actually using the tools that you have on your machines today. So a good way to, to picture this, um, we've got a picture of a ladder here. Is that ladder a threat to you? Okay, so it's just sat there with some buckets, maybe someone's cleaning some windows. But when it's in a different context, that ladder then becomes a threat. So now somebody could access your top level windows, access your house. Okay, and what we're seeing is that attackers are actually using um, the tools that they have on the PCs today to attack you. Um, so what I mean is things like um, Microsoft Word and macros being used very heavily, um, email systems, um, Microsoft PowerShell, and maybe even Sys internal tools, as well as um, Internet of Things. So why, why are they choosing these? Well, um, most users or basic users have access to these tools. Um, they can run them. Um, and it's not usually um, tracked in any way. It won't arouse suspicion. Um, so essentially, attackers are actually hiding in plain sight um, in your network. Okay, one of the main things they're using today is actually PowerShell. So um, uh, most people will know what PowerShell is if they work in IT, but it's uh, a, a system scripting language. It's been around for 10 years, okay. It's installed on almost every machine, every Windows machine now available. Um, and our Blue Coat proxies um, ran a study recently and they found that 95% of PowerShell scripts which came through our proxy technology um, actually were malicious in the wild. So why do attackers like PowerShell? 
So as I mentioned before, it's installed on every machine. Um, an attacker doesn't need to go and find uh, a zero-day vulnerability, which is a lot harder to do these days. They can just use this scripting technology. Um, PowerShell can be obfuscated, so the, the script can be hidden as well. And it can be run in memory, so it could be a, what we call a fileless attack. And what we're seeing, the typical um, malware infection that we're seeing today is that um, an email would come in containing probably a macro. That macro would launch a PowerShell command, and that PowerShell command would do the downloading. So it would go off, and it would download the malware of choice, which is normally um, ransomware today. PowerShell is often used also for tra traversing inside, inside a network. Um, so there's a couple of uses for PowerShell today. So what else have we seen in the last 12 months? So um, unique pieces of malware, 401 million in the last 12 months. That's actually slightly reduced um, from the year before. 89% of that malware was actually first seen this year. A couple of other interesting statistics. 20% um, of all malware that we've tracked um, is virtual machine aware. So there's a lot of cybersecurity vendors that will do sandboxing technology, take the malware, run it in a sandbox. Malware authors are now um, becoming aware of this and they're training their malware if they know it's in a virtual machine, not to run, um, to hide maybe for another week, etc. We're also seeing a massive increase in SSL um, encryption of the, um, the communications of malware. Okay, so we're going to move on. I'm going to go through quite quickly all these different sections. The next one is targeted attacks. And we have seen a big shift in the way targeted attacks have worked in the last year. So in the Internet Threat Report, um, we always produce a timeline of the notable attacks throughout the last year. And again, you can look into the if you download the report. In the past, these were mostly um, espionage. So getting secrets um, from nation states or big businesses. In the last year, we saw a big shift, okay? We saw a lot of sabotage, okay? So sabotage, very new for us in a targeted attack. And we saw a lot of subversion. So causing confusion for maybe political gain. And this was kind of politics by another means and a real shift in the landscape of targeted attacks. So we talk about sabotage at first. Now, um, a couple of examples, the first one being Shamoon. Uh, we first saw Shamoon four years ago in the Middle East, and it is a disk wiping Trojan, so it will wipe the computers. Okay, four years ago in 2012, it was targeted to a lot of um, oil companies in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so one example, it's public, was Saudi Aramco. Saudi Aramco is the second largest oil producer in the world. Um, at Saudi Aramco, um, the malware was spread around the organization. Um, just before the start of a holiday, they kicked it off and they attempted to wipe every single computer in Saudi Aramco. Um, they succeeded in wiping 35,000 computers. The computers were completely wiped and a picture of a burning US flag was replaced on this computer screen. Four years on to last year, we saw Shamoon return. Okay? Again, it was political, um, most likely from Iran. Again, it wiped computers in the oil sector. Um, this time, it displayed a picture of the small um, Syrian boy, um, that well-known image we saw of him washed up on shore, um, but again, wiped those computers in that sector. Um, we saw a lot of attacks in Ukraine. So we saw two attacks, major attacks last year, again, with disk wiping software. And if we could also include Petra, uh, the most recent attack, as part of that. Um, the Sandworm Group was, uh, we think, possibly responsible for some of the attacks in Ukraine. Again, wiping machines, targeting the energy sector for disruption. Um, they actually caused power outages in the Ukraine. Subversion, okay, so the, um, the democratic, sorry, the, um, the presidential campaign, um, so the Democratic National Party in the US um, got hacked, um, and the Hillary, Hillary Clinton campaign had around 20,000 emails and attachments released um, into the wild, and that certainly affected their campaign. Um, Donald Trump used that to, to his advantage, and 
where, where we are today. Um, so these sort of subversive attacks um, are very new. Um, the two attackers that we believe were involved in that was two Russian groups called the Cozy Bears and the Fancy Bears. Um, the FBI have kind of fingerprinted these two groups. Um, the Fancy Bears were also involved in the World Anti-Doping Association hack, where again, very subversive uh, tactics, um, releasing details of doping to try and indicate that it's not just uh, Russia doing that doping. So again, it's a move to very overt, public, subversive campaigns on the targeted attacks. Okay, so cyber bank heists, a bit more exciting. So I don't know if anyone is aware, but a, a bank in Bangladesh um, lost $81 million this year, or last year. Okay, um, now that was a fraction of what the attackers tried to get. Okay, our analysis of that malware, uh, the malware is called Bandswift, um, points back to a group called Lazarus, and the Lazarus group, um, the FBI have associated to North Korea. So essentially, we do believe this was a uh, North Korea sponsored attack. So if you remember, the Lazarus group was um, fingerprinted as responsible for the Sony Pictures attack, uh, where they released um, the film, um, the interview, because um, it offended uh, some of the leadership there. Okay, so how did, how did they do it? So they targeted um, a bank where they knew um, there was pretty poor security. So it was a, a, a bank in the Bangladesh, and they stole the SWIFT uh, credentials. So those that don't know, SWIFT is the network where banks will talk to each other and transfer money. So just to point out, SWIFT was not hacked in any way. They simply got in and stole the credentials there to SWIFT. They made a request to transfer some money, okay? to the, uh, one of the US federal banks, and they made a request to transfer 81 million to a company in the Philippines, and 20 million to a company in Sri Lanka. Now, they also had malware that would cover their tracks, so it would delete stuff from logs, it would give re receipts back on these transactions, so it was very, very clever, um, the attack in total. However, the 20 million um, they did not get, okay? Um, that was blocked due to a spelling mistake. So they wanted to trans transfer it to the Shahika Foundation, and they typed foundation as foundation. So that's a, a 20 million uh, US dollar spelling mistake made there. Deutsche Bank picked up that spelling mistake and put a hold on that transaction. Okay. Now the Lazarus Group actually tried to um, download, sorry, tried to um, take another 850 million from another 30 banks around the world, and this was, this was blocked. So it would have bought a lot of rockets for, um, for North Korea. Okay, so let's move on to email. So what we've seen in 2016 is that email has become um, the weapon of choice for attackers. So essentially, it's the golden ticket at the moment. In the past three years, we've seen um, the amount of emails, malicious emails, rise. So today, um, one out of 100 in every 31 email will contain malicious content. So how do you build a malicious email? Well, it's good to know this, because um, this will help you looking out for them as well. So our studies have shown 89% um, of malicious email has English as the language. Um, now that may be for A, who they're targeting, and we'll talk about that. Uh, later, so they're obviously talk targeting um, the more affluent countries. They're also targeting um, businesses where the business language may be English. The subject line in a malicious email um, leading the way is invoice, okay? And the top subject lines are financial related, so there's nothing makes you open an email more knowing that somebody's wanting money off you or you owe some money to someone. Um, second top was things like scan, um, emailing. Um, so um, if someone sent you a scan, you might be tempted to open up that email, have a look what it is. What it is. And interestingly, the third top subject for malicious email was mail delivery failure. So I'm sure we've all received a mail delivery failure email with a little attachment and double clicked on it to see what it is. Um, and that's one of the things they're trying to, trying to get you to do. The sender in a malicious email is often spoofed from a well-known um, well specific company or region. Could also be using domain squatting, so a typo in that domain. 
And the attachment of choice at the moment is a word file, okay? So you're most likely to see a word file. I think all of us have been taught not to open executables or scripts in email, but word files, right? They're okay. Um, and for several years, they have been okay. So um, 20 years ago, we had macro viruses, okay? And Microsoft kindly turned off macros automatically. And they would put a nice little warning if someone was trying to enable macros in Word. Um, you see it highlighted in red there. So how do the attackers get you to enable macros to be able to run that code? So they use plain old social engineering. So what they'll do is they'll fill up the document with gobbledygook and they'll simply say um, enable macros and you'll be able to see the content of that document. And that is enough to, to basically social engineer, get people to enable macros and the content then runs, usually followed by PowerShell. Some of the other things they do, they'll put a nice picture in. So like here, they said this document is created with an old incompatible version of Office. Click macros and, and you'll be able to see that document. We've also seen um, embedded executables in Word. So a nice example there says, to see this receipt, double click on the image. You're actually double clicking on an executable that's been embedded into Word. So again, Word is very prevalent at the moment. Some other low-tech attacks, so again, these are um, not using any kind of malware, and we're seeing a lot, and there's a big rise in uh, what's called business email compromise. It's also known as CEO whaling. So essentially what this means is somebody contacting someone in your finance department and asking them to transfer some money. Um, but it's a bit more um, complex than that. So often they will try and impersonate the CEO or someone of importance. They'll put pressure on the person in finance. Um, we've also seen them actually call in on the telephone and say, you need to transfer this money. We're going to acquire this company. It's secret. Please transfer to this account. Um, we've also seen impersonating, so taking on the accent of the CEO when they ring in to get them to transfer that money. Uh, one of the biggest losses, um, I think it was a company in Austria, um, lost $40 million in a business email compromise um, scam. And again, just social engineering. Very prevalent in small business uh, today as well. So moving on to cloud. I'm pretty sure everybody uses a cloud service of some sort. Um, and this guy, does anyone know John Podesta? Not many, not many heard of him. So he was the chairman of the Hillary Clinton campaign, okay? part of the Democratic National Committee. And he was involved in probably what, one of the biggest phishing attacks um, we've ever seen. So John Podesta um, received an email, and this is the exact email he received. Okay, and it says, someone has your password. Um, it looks like the kind of one you get from Google. It also says where it's come from. It says it's from the Ukraine, so it's you know, somewhere out east, somewhere scary. And it says you should click to change your password. So again, totally copied from, from the Google site. So if you were to highlight over that click button, uh, as we generally ask people to do, what he would have seen was that the URL actually looks pretty good, right? So it says myaccount.google.com, then dash security setting page.tk. So to, uh, to anyone else, that looks like a Google account, but actually the domain is .tk, and that's um, a place off New Zealand. So this is a, a, a very targeted, a very clever phishing attack. Um, if John was to click on that link, he would have received this page uh, where he would have been asked to put in his current password and what his new password is going to be. He would have then been redirected uh, back to Google from there. But John didn't do this, luckily. What John did was he sent this email to his IT department. Okay? And um, his IT department replied back with the following message. It says, John needs to change his password immediately and ensure that two-factor authentication is turned on. So some fantastic advice by the IT department. Well done. He also gave John the link. Said, go to this link, myaccount.google.com forward slash security, and, and do that work there. So again, a, a great response from the IT department. 
However, again, he made a typo. So he wrote at the start, this is a legitimate email. Um, in, in interviews, he was supposed to, he said he was supposed to write, this is an illegitimate email. Um, but he wrote, this is a legitimate email. What that mistake meant was that John Podesta didn't actually go here. He went back to the original email, clicked on the link, put his password in, uh, and then they lost 20,000 emails, documents, communications. Uh, Donald Trump used that against them, and kind of the rest is, is history on that one. So the main point here, two-factor authentication. So um, any businesses out there probably have two-factor authentication on their network. So if you're connecting in from home to the VPN, you'll be using two-factor authentication. Um, we're not using it as much as we should do for cloud applications. Um, so most cloud applications, Gmail, Amazon, PayPal, have options to enable two-factor authentication. If John had done that, um, even if the attacker had his password, he would have got a message on his phone, okay? Um, he would have probably rejected that as he hadn't logged in himself. Okay, also talking about the cloud, um, our Blue Coat um, group ran a study um, and they asked um, a lot of CIOs how many cloud apps are used in your organization today? And the CIOs answered uh, between 30 and 40 cloud apps, which I think might resonate with, with, with businesses out there. Um, we actually ran their network logs um, through our CASB solution, and we found that the actual number that these companies were using was around 928 cloud apps. So this is a real challenge uh, going forward with things like shadow data, people sharing links, so in OneDrive, in Google Docs, um, we found that 25% of people are sharing those links without any protection. So there's a lot of data out there, which is a very important conversation for GDPR as well. Okay, so Internet of Things is the next topic. Internet of Things, um, the beautiful world, they tend to break themselves, right? So they either run out of batteries or break themselves. But I kind of looking forward, I think we are going to see probably ransomware on Internet of Things, ransomware on your watch, ransomware on your phone. We're already starting to see that. Uh, ransomware is here to stay, unfortunately, and that's the kind of thing we're probably going to see going forward. So what's the problem with Internet of Things? Well, in 2004, um, security researchers put a, a Windows XP computer on the Internet without any patches. So it's directly on the Internet. Okay. And that machine was attacked within four minutes. So within four minutes in 2004, someone had tried to put a Trojan or attack that machine. Last year, the semantic researchers put an IoT device on the internet. So it's like a, a honeypot. Um, that was attacked within two minutes. So there's a lot of people trying to get hold of these IoT devices. And I'll, I'll talk about why as well. Also, a trend we're seeing was quite worrying. In the start of last year, um, we saw five attacks per hour on our honeypot. By the end of that year, it was almost double to nine an hour. So again, the trend is picking up a lot on IoT. So what is the problem with IoT? So IoT has a lot of shortcomings. So people are making security cameras, watches, they're more interested in um, stability rather than security. So most likely they'll be using Linux, and most likely they'll be using a stable old version that might have vulnerabilities. There's also no real way of updating these IoT devices. Okay, so if you think about a new um, family, maybe have gone out and bought an internet-based uh, video camera to uh, baby camera, they're not going to be interested in actually patching this. Um, and if they were to patch it, they probably would have had to uh, flash the ROM, okay, and they're not going to be very interested in doing that. But the main problem is that um, IoT devices come hard-coded with default passwords. So you can see um, this is what the attackers are using, admin, root, the basic test passwords um, to get in to these IoT devices. So why are they interested in IoT devices? Well, a good example is Mirai. So uh, the Mirai is a, a botnet. And what a botnet is, is a, a group of computers or IoT devices um, that can be used for mostly denial of service attacks. It could be then hired out. Um, and the Mirai botnet, um, we estimate to be around 500,000 IoT devices. Is that important? Well, it actually, um, last year, attacked a DNS service 
and brought down Netflix and Twitter. So you've got the weird situation where your TV is actually um, brought down Netflix. So as more and more IT devices come online, um, Gartner says 20 billion by 2020. Um, putting some security into those is going to be pretty important. Okay, so the last topic is good old ransomware. Everyone loves a bit of ransomware. So we have seen an, a 36% increase last year in ransomware attacks. In the previous years, that was higher, okay, in the hundreds of percents. Um, so that it is very prevalent. Um, it's probably the number one sort of attack vector at the moment. The reasons being it's highly profitable, okay. If you are actually going out to try and make money from ransomware, possibly WannaCry and Petra weren't about that. Um, but there is good money to be made. It's very low barrier to entry. So you can go on the dark net and you can actually have your own ransomware created for you and they will actually manage the service for you. They'll manage the payments. All you've got to do is distribute it in some way. Okay, so it's very easy to get it out there. Now, in the last two years, we've seen consumers. So this is picked up by our Norton antivirus. Consumers being uh, the most attacked people. So at home, people opening emails, attachments, etc. The enterprise only hit by about a third. And um, that kind of changed this year. So if you look at the chart here, in blue is the consumers. Um, in May and June, all of a sudden, it's, it's enterprises being attacked. That's mostly attributed to, um, to the WannaCry and Petra attacks um, that were using the Eternal Blue exploit um, and worm-like capabilities. So Symantec's actually blocked over one billion WannaCry infections to date with all our technology. And the average ransomware demand has gone up. So that may be in line with the Bitcoin price, okay? Um, but it may also be the fact that um, they're being more successful. So, so in 2015, it was $294. Last year, the average ransomware was $1,077. So the highest ransom for a single machine we saw was $28,000. And the highest ransomware ever paid was a, a company in South Korea, a hosting company. They had um, 300 Linux servers were held by ransomware. Um, the attackers wanted $4 million. The attackers will negotiate. They negotiated down to $1 million, and the South Korean company paid that $1 million. They kind of had to. There was that or going out of business. They'd lost all of their servers um, and the backup didn't work, which is often we see. Okay, so what's driving up the ransom demand? So essentially paying it is driving up. So if you have a backup, you're less likely to pay. What we are seeing, unfortunately, is that newer ransomware is not only uh, encrypting your files, but it's also stealing some data. And it will um, say, okay, pay the money or actually we'll release this personal identifiable data as well into the wild. Um, so there's a kind of a new attack coming on. But 34% of people globally pay the ransomware once their computers are infected. In the US, that's almost double, 64%. I don't have any, any knowledge or reason why that's the case, um, but the US or the Americans certainly are paying more often than not. And that also means that they're being targeted. So the attackers are actually targeting the countries uh, that are most likely to pay and have the most money. And so the United States very much are being targeted um, by ransomware. So finally, how is ransomware spread? Um, lots of different ways, okay? Things like third-party app stores on, on Android, um, so you can have your phone ransomware. Um, on Facebook, uh, like the Lockie ransomware was a Facebook picture. Or um, less common vulnerabilities, so like WannaCry and Petra, um, using that nice eternal blue vulnerability to spread. But the most common way that ransomware gets into your business or into your home computer is the good old golden ticket via email and uh, a Word document. Okay, so it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Again, I do encourage everyone to read the full report, um, download it from the website. A couple of recommendations um, from the report that we, we've brought out. So firstly, um, corporations are still very bad at patching. 
Um, so patching is relatively easy. There's a lot of automated ways of doing it, uh, both from Microsoft or, or other vendors like ourselves. Okay. Um, WannaCry and Petra, that patch, to stop the spread of that was out in March. Okay. People are still getting hit by WannaCry. Um, so get better at patching, keeping your systems up to date, keep your security software up to date as well. That's probably the, the number one message. For businesses, um, invest in an email hygiene service. So again, the number one attack vector at the moment is email. Okay, so make sure we're scanning emails before they come down to your endpoints, before anyone has a chance to open it. Um, don't leave it down to the endpoint to, to stop that. At home, and this is something you can tell your mum and your dad as well, okay? Delete any suspicious looking email uh, you receive. Don't be tempted to open it, even if it says invoice, even if it says mail delivery um, response or anything like that. Just don't open it, just delete it. It's probably not for you. Um, and one in every 131 will be malicious. Never enable macros. I've never been sent, in my, in my business career, never been sent a, a Word document that I had to enable macros on. Okay, so there's no need to enable macros unless you're totally sure it's come from someone uh, trusted. Okay. And finally, um, use two-factor authentication when you can. Use it on your personal email. That's kind of the keys to the kingdom okay, for yourselves. Um, most cloud service will offer that, very easy to set up. Um, take advantage of that and use that. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I'll hand it back to Stephen.